They stomp through sand, mud, snow, and rubble, and still hold strong. We're talking about military boots, built tough, worn by soldiers, and engineered for survival. But how exactly are they made? Today, we'll cover how these high-performance boots are manufactured, from raw leather to combat-ready pairs. Every military boot starts with a choice of leather. Not all hides are equal and only the strongest, full-grain cowhide or split leather makes the cut. Full grain offers durability and weather resistance, while split leather, often paired with nylon or canvas, creates lighter hybrid boots for jungle or desert operations. These raw hides are shipped in large rolls to manufacturing plants where they're inspected for scars, thickness, and grain integrity. Each hide is tanned using either chrome tanning, which uses chromium salts to make the leather soft, flexible, and highly resistant to water, or vegetable tanning, a plant-based method that produces firmer leather with better breathability, ideal for hot, dry environments. Once tanned, they're cut into smaller panels using computer-guided lasers that ensure zero waste and perfect shape alignment. Modern combat boots also feature Cordura fabric, Kevlar panels, or Gore-Tex layers. These synthetic materials are chosen based on the intended terrain, whether that's icy mountain zones or scorching deserts. Every component, down to the thread has to be certified for military standards, known as mil-spec. And that's just the upper layer. Beneath it all, a surprisingly complex sole system. Unlike everyday sneakers, military boots require soles that can absorb impact, resist oil and chemicals, and maintain traction on uneven terrain. First, the midsole is molded using a material called polyurethane, or ethylene vinyl acetate, these are poured into foot-shaped molds and then compressed under heat, usually around 300 degrees Fahrenheit, to form a cushioned, shock-absorbing base. The key is balance. Too soft, and it wears quickly. Too hard, and it reduces mobility. So, engineers run tests on rebound, flexibility, and pressure distribution for every batch. Then comes the outsole, the rugged bottom layer. This is usually made from high-durability rubber or vibram compounds. Outsoles are cast in thick molds that include tread patterns optimized for grip on wet rocks, loose gravel, or steel surfaces. Once cooled, both layers are joined with strong adhesives and sometimes stitched directly to the boot using Goodyear welting or direct attach methods. These construction techniques determine how long the boot can last in harsh field conditions. And before it even meets the upper, there's one more hidden layer inside. A great military boot has to do two things at once, protect and comfort. That's where the inner linings and reinforcements come in. The inside of the boot is layered with antimicrobial linings to reduce sweat, odor, and bacteria. Materials like moisture-wicking nylon mesh or padded foam linings are bonded to the leather shell, giving soldiers a more breathable and comfortable interior, especially during 12-hour missions. Around the toe and heel, composite reinforcements are added for impact protection. To reduce weight, these aren't steel but instead high-grade thermoplastic or fiberglass toe caps. These can withstand up to 200 joules of force and meet ANSI standards for protective footwear. Shank plates, usually made of nylon or fiberglass, are inserted between the sole and insole to provide foot arch support and resist sharp object penetration. You can step on nails or shrapnel without injury. And yes, Ankle padding and heel counters are also molded to create a snug, blister-resistant fit. The last thing a soldier needs in the field, a sore foot. If you're into engineering, gear design, or just love seeing how tough things are built, don't forget to subscribe. Now it's time to stitch the upper and sole together, and here's where the boot becomes truly battle-ready. Using heavy-duty stitching machines, skilled operators sew each leather and fabric panel together following strict patterns. These seams are double-stitched and sometimes triple-reinforced, depending on the boot's military application. The stitched upper is then joined to the sole using two main methods, Goodyear welt construction or direct injection. The first involves a stitched welt, a strip of leather or rubber that locks the upper and sole together, creating a boot that's both waterproof and resolable. The second injects molten polyurethane between the upper and sole, bonding them permanently faster, lighter, and often used in mass production. 
After this, boots are pressed in hydraulic molds to fuse the structure under intense heat and pressure, aligning the shape and ensuring zero gaps. Once cooled, each boot is trimmed, de-threaded, and checked for structural alignment. But we're not done yet, now it's time for a brutal series of tests. Military boots don't head out the door until they've been through some seriously tough tests. First, each pair is dunked in water tanks and flexed thousands of times by robotic machines to check for leaks. If even a drop gets through the seams, that entire batch is rejected. Next up is the abrasion test. Boots are rubbed against rough, sandpaper-like rollers for hours to simulate months of wear and tear. Then there's the impact test, where a heavy weight is dropped from six feet right onto the toe to make sure it can handle real-world blows. Some models even go through extreme climate testing. They're placed in special chambers that simulate desert heat, up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, freezing Arctic cold, as low as negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and swampy humidity, all to make sure they hold up anywhere on Earth. Other pairs are worn by field testers during intense endurance drills to gauge real-time performance. In combat, gear failure isn't an inconvenience, it's a life-threatening risk. That's why no pair gets approved unless it meets the highest standard of reliability. Only the boots that pass every single test move on to the final stage. And that's where the finishing touches like laces, ID tags, and packaging come in. Once a boot proves it can handle the toughest conditions, it's time for the final touches. Durable military-grade laces made from tough polyester or nylon are threaded through reinforced eyelets and speed hooks. Depending on the model, these may be machine-pressed or laser-riveted for extra hold. Some boots also include smart features like drainage vents, side zippers for quick removal, or ID tags sewn into the tongue to help with tracking and inventory. Every boot is labeled with a batch code, showing when and where it was made, plus which materials were used, just in case a recall or inspection is ever needed. After one last check, the boots are paired, stuffed with shape-holding inserts and packed into protective, water-resistant boxes. Then they're grouped on pallets and shipped out to military bases, tactical gear stores, or deployment zones across the world. And if you're curious, yes, each pair is traceable down to the exact minute it was molded. That's how precise and strict military standards are. Combat boots have a legacy that stretches back thousands of years. Ancient Roman legionnaires wore caligae, open-toed leather sandals reinforced with hobnails, to endure long marches across Europe and North Africa. Fast forward to the Napoleonic era, and you'll find early lace-up leather boots being used by infantry, offering better ankle support and foot protection on the battlefield. In the trenches of World War I, soldiers were issued thick, hobnailed trench boots, durable but often waterlogged and cold. By World War II, the U.S. military began standardizing boots with leather uppers and rubber soles, tailored for different terrains. This gave rise to the first real combat boot as we know it. The Vietnam War introduced jungle boots, lighter, breathable, with canvas sides and drainage holes to handle swampy terrain. The Korean War led to the development of cold-weather boots with insulation and waterproofing. Today, armies issue a wide range of mission-specific boots, desert, jungle, mountain, and airborne models. Civilian demand has also grown. The U.S. military alone distributes over 2 million pairs annually, each one built on centuries of evolution and innovation. Military boots are more than just footwear, they're a survival tool. From Kevlar to comfort, every detail is engineered for protection, performance, and longevity. And that hidden layer we mentioned earlier? It's the shank plate, usually fiberglass, that keeps the arch supported and your foot safe from punctures. If you enjoyed this deep dive, hit that subscribe button and tell us in the comments. Which piece surprised you most? The pressure tests or the smart moisture wicking liners? Over 4.5 million barrels of cement, a raging river, and a race against time. The Hoover Dam was more than concrete and steel, it was a test of human will and raw material strength. Step 1. Quarrying the ingredients. Limestone and clay. To build something as monumental as the Hoover Dam, the first step was gathering the right raw materials. Cement, specifically Portland cement, starts with two critical ingredients. Limestone and clay. For this project, engineers relied heavily on the Arizona Portland Cement Company's quarry, 
located in Clarkdale, Arizona, about 300 miles away from the dam site. This was no small task. Crews worked around the clock, drilling and blasting through rugged terrain to extract millions of tons of limestone and shale. Once the rock was broken down, it was crushed on site into smaller pieces suitable for transport. Each train car was loaded with approximately 70 tons of crushed stone, and trains often carried up to 35 carloads per day to keep up with demand. Over the entire project, more than 1.5 million tons of raw material were moved. But it wasn't just about volume, it was about precision. Every shipment of crushed rock underwent rigorous testing in on-site labs to ensure the chemical makeup was exactly right. Calcium carbonate, silica, alumina, and iron oxide all had to be in perfect balance. Even a slight deviation could compromise the entire structure. Step 2. The Kilns Turning Rock into Clinker Once the raw materials arrived at the cement plant, the real transformation began. The crushed limestone and clay were first ground down to a fine powder, but turning that powder into cement required firepower. The mixture was fed into enormous rotary kilns, which were long, cylindrical steel tubes stretching up to 400 feet in length and 15 feet in diameter. As the kilns rotated slowly, the material inside was heated to around 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly 1,480 degrees Celsius. At these blistering temperatures, a remarkable chemical reaction occurred, fusing the raw materials into marble-sized pellets known as clinker. These clinkers were the building blocks of true Portland cement. At full capacity, the kilns produced more than 2,500 barrels of cement per day, an astonishing output that kept the project on schedule. After cooling, the clinker was sent through grinding mills where it was crushed once more and combined with a small amount of gypsum, around 5% by weight. This final touch was crucial because it controlled how quickly the cement would set when mixed with water. What came out of the process was the fine gray powder we recognize as cement, ready to be used in one of the biggest construction projects the world had ever seen. Here's a question for you. Do you know how long it would have taken for the dam's concrete to cool naturally if they hadn't used a special cooling system? Tell your guesses in comments. We'll reveal the answer at the end. And if you love epic engineering stories, hit that subscribe button now. Step 3. How Cement Got to the Dam Producing cement was only half the battle. Getting it from the plant to the dam was a whole different challenge, and engineers had to think creatively to overcome it. Trucks and trains could only do so much, especially given the remote and rugged location of the Hoover Dam site. To solve the problem, the team built a custom aerial cableway system that was nothing short of revolutionary. Massive steel buckets carried barrels of cement, each weighing about 376 pounds across the deep Colorado River Canyon to the heart of the dam site. These buckets moved along high wires that spanned the canyon, delivering cement with incredible speed and precision. At the peak of construction, 16 cableways operated around the clock, keeping the flow of cement constant and efficient. The pace was relentless. Workers were able to pour up to 8,000 cubic yards of concrete in just 24 hours. A record-breaking rate at the time, timing was everything. Once cement is mixed with water, the chemical reaction begins immediately, so there is no room for delay. This aerial cableway system kept everything moving seamlessly, allowing the dam to rise higher and faster than anyone had thought possible. Step 4. Beating the heat One of the most mind-blowing challenges the engineers faced was managing the heat generated by the curing concrete. Here's the thing. Concrete generates a significant amount of heat as it hardens, a process called the heat of hydration. If the Hoover Dam had been poured as a single solid block, it would have taken an estimated 125 years to cool naturally. Not only that, but the intense heat buildup would have caused the concrete to crack and fail long before it ever became operational. To tackle this, engineers devised a brilliant plan. Instead of pouring the dam in one giant piece, they divided it into a series of interlocking concrete blocks, each about 50 feet square and 5 feet high. But even that wasn't enough to manage the heat. They also embedded over 582 miles of 1-inch steel cooling pipes within the concrete. After each block was poured, chilled river water, 
kept at around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, was pumped through the pipes. This pulled excess heat from the concrete, allowing it to cool and cure evenly in just weeks rather than decades. The cooling system was a groundbreaking innovation, one of the first of its kind on such a massive scale. Thanks to this clever engineering, the Hoover Dam's concrete remains crack-free and rock-solid nearly 90 years later. Step 5. The perfect recipe for concrete mix. So, what exactly made this concrete so legendary? The recipe was deceptively simple but precisely calculated. The mix contained roughly 40% sand, 50% gravel, crushed rock, and 10% Portland cement powder. But the real secret lay in the size of the aggregate. Engineers used extra-large stones, some measuring up to 9 inches across, to reduce the amount of cement needed per cubic yard. This not only kept the mix strong, but also helped minimize the heat produced during curing. By the end of construction, the Hoover Dam had consumed a staggering 4.36 million cubic yards of concrete, more than 5 million barrels of cement, and approximately 10 million tons of total material. To put it into perspective, the amount of concrete used could have paved a four-foot-wide sidewalk circling the entire Earth, an astonishing symbol of the project's sheer scale. But even more remarkable than the volume is the dam's durability. Nearly a century later, thanks to its meticulously engineered mix and groundbreaking cooling system, the Hoover Dam stands as one of the toughest and most enduring feats of construction in human history. Cement has ancient roots dating back to the Romans, who mixed volcanic ash and lime to build enduring marvels like the Pantheon. But modern Portland cement, the type used for the Hoover Dam, was invented in 1824 by Joseph Aspton in England. By the early 20th century, it had become essential to global infrastructure, with U.S. companies like Lehigh Portland Cement and Atlas Cement dominating the market. When the Hoover Dam was greenlit by the Boulder Canyon Project Act of 1928, it posed an unprecedented challenge, producing and delivering over 4.5 million barrels of cement, enough to build a two-lane highway from New York to San Francisco. The Arizona Portland Cement Company became a key supplier, and new rail lines and storage silos were built to keep up with the relentless pace of construction. Today, global cement giants like Lafarge Holcim and Cemex continue to build on these foundations, pushing the limits of what's possible in modern construction. So, remember that trivia question from earlier? Do you know how long it would have taken for the dam's concrete to cool naturally if they hadn't used a special cooling system? The answer is, if the Hoover Dam's concrete hadn't been cooled with its ingenious pipe system, it would have taken a jaw-dropping 125 years to cool naturally. That's the power of smart engineering. Next time you see the Hoover Dam, know you're looking at a masterclass in material science, precision planning, and pure human determination. The cement that built the Hoover Dam wasn't just mixed, it was engineered to perfection. If you found this story as mind-blowing as we did, click that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss another epic deep dive into the world's greatest engineering marvels. Thanks for watching!